I wanted to first start off by saying welcome and happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. And uh, we can and should be grateful for the country that we live in. And while America is not perfect, we are certainly blessed, aren't we? Especially with the freedom to worship and gather here today. And so uh, I was thinking about that this morning, just being grateful to be able to be with you as a church. And then also grateful, while we want to be, that's appropriate to be grateful for our earthly citizenship, you know, even more so we're grateful for our heavenly citizenship. Amen. Knowing that, you know, that we have an eternal, secure, perfect home waiting for us, and we can just delight in that. A couple other announcements for you this morning. In your bulletin is um, an envelope. That's for our Helping Hands. Helping Hands is our benevolence, how we just help people inside and outside the congregation. And that's funded um, pretty much solely by people just giving above and beyond specifically to that. So if you would want to uh, give to that, you're welcome to do so. Also, uh, check out your bulletin. There are a lot of things going on in women's ministry still. There's movie nights and uh, a women's little retreat going on. That's Bible study stuff. Also, VBS is coming quickly. So please pay special attention to VBS stuff there. There's a work night coming up, which we would really want your help to. Uh, if, if you are new and haven't been part of our VBSs, they transform the facility. It, the, this place just looks dramatically different. So there's a lot of set up stuff that we do for that there's also a volunteer meeting and some more supplies needed if you would like to contribute materially in those manners in, the, in that manner as well uh the last thing i just got sprung out this morning the drakes where's greg at he was floating around early he must be out doing something huh. uh the drakes uh, if you have a, if you don't know them they're they're pleasant people if you're okay with <laughs> if you're okay with corny jokes um Hey, the Drake said next, next Sunday they're going to host a party at their house. They just live about uh, five minutes from here. They have a pond, uh, water volleyball. I think the zip, zip line working? No zip line yet? Okay, never mind. Scratch, ixnay the zip nay. Uh, trampoline, yard games. But they said, uh, come on out. They'll grill some hot dogs, provide drinks. You can just bring a side if you want and enjoy time. That's especially for, you know, families, young families. Our kids love being in the pond there. And then if you are a newer person with us and you're kind of dipping your toe in the water, wanting to get to know the Hopeful family more, uh, this is a great chance to just get to know people more as you recreate around the, the, the pond and then laugh at people uh, jumping off the high platform. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. Bob, I think you're praying today, right? So bring it. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, body. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, um, just that we have an extended family that can go to encourage each other's hospitality and friendship and just ask that you be with um, Pastor Wesley at the Olive Branch Church. Uh, just help them with the work that they're doing to spread your word as well. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Good, mor good morning. <laughs> Every time. Hey, it's great to be with you. Will you stand with us as we celebrate the great things that God has done, the great things that he's doing right now, and everything that he will continue to do. Faithful 
through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have some great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things.
My friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord, our God has done great things that we can celebrate, that we can rejoice in all the time, that he has brought us into his family, that he has made us one with him, that he has set us free, that he's given us a new life, and that he has loved us. And so let's sing out how deep the Father's love, and we, and we are done with that. Let's just respond to the fact that he has loved us by declaring our love for him and thank him with worship. Let's sing together. How deep the Father's love for us and how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure And how great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring me sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call
thank you that you have brought us in your family and that you have called us chosen that you have not forsaken us but in fact quite the opposite you ran to us God we thank you for the great things that you have done we thank you for the great things that you are doing right now in the church all around the world and even right here God we thank you and we give you praise because you have loved us, God, we want to say that we love you too. And we hope that this morning, that as we sing, it's just a sweet sounding ear, something that blesses you. Just a small portion of what you have blessed us with, God. You are so good, so holy, so mighty and powerful that how can we not bring you praise? How can we not respond to your goodness by singing, by rejoicing, by gathering together to lift you up high? God, you are worthy of it all. And we want to say that we love you. So it's in your name that we pray and worship. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks, church family. Will you turn to someone next to you and just wish them a great morning? Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Well, it is good to worship with you this morning. It is good to have fellowship with you this morning. 
and again, welcome. Uh, I want to start with, with, a, with a reminder of something that you probably already know, that people are lonely in America, even on this weekend. The young people and the elderly are especially at risk. While these trends were already growing, they skyrocketed during and post the pandemic. As one study said, why is loneliness in young adults so prevalent today? Recent research shows that experiencing loneliness in your 20s is near the top of the list of challenges for both Generation Z and Millennials. Despite all the latest communication technologies, the relationship between loneliness and young people is growing stronger as many young adults feel a growing sense of isolation. Although society is more connected than ever before by social media and mobile devices, today's young people lack the intimacy of face-to-face -face human interaction. As a result, there is a heightened level of isolation, and young adults are looking for an understanding of how to overcome loneliness and depression. Ironically, research on the behavior of these plugged-in generations reveals that technology is a big part of the problem. Indeed, many researchers and mental health professionals believe that the ubiquitous nature of social media and the constant availability of online communication lie at the root of the issue. It seems that virtual connections are preventing more authentic, real-life connections. So highlighting the need for young people. And then, again, the elderly are experiencing loneliness, right? Because they live in, uh, been more isolated at home. They're, you know, we see more, as more families break down, you have less kids as kids are scattered, or the message declares very loudly to kids, you should reject your parents and cut them off if they disagree with your moral stance or decisions in life. Um, you know, elderly are increasingly isolated as well. The point, one of the critical issues facing the church is the lack of in-person relationships. Surprise, surprise. God is aware of the cost to human people when we are isolated, which is why he gives us the passage that we're in today as we're on the home stretch. The last chapter of the book of Hebrews. It's been a long journey. Here we go. Hebrews 13, 1. He says this. And the first point is brotherly love. Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. Now last week I, I, I talked to you about theology and praxology, right? As we discussed, God ties together theology, who he is and what he does with praxology, what we should do, right? Because God, therefore we. Right? That's the repeated frame of the Christian life. Because God, therefore we. And as elsewhere in the Bible, the believer is not left to work out the ethical implications of faith in Christ. The particular obedience required is carefully defined. The, so when God gives you theology, he says, this is how I want you to respond to theology. This is what I've done. Let me tell you how I want you to respond, right? Like we teach our kids. I give you something. I teach you how to respond. You don't just get to make up whatever response you want. You say, thank you. Right? We teach people how to respond when something happens. And God is saying the same thing. In Scripture, he acts and he tells us how to respond to him. As another quote says, For the Christian message has profound social and moral implications. They are not merely implications which can be considered and then ignored as an optional addendum to a more spiritual message. The point is, right, Like the, the implications to morality and society are required. They're part of the Christian message, not optional extras. Therefore, if this is true, it demands the following changes in your life. Again, theology leads to praxology. Put plainly, yet again, God makes it clear how we are to respond to him, how we are to respond to him. We don't have the option as Christians to ignore the specific responses that God gives. So when God says, let brotherly love continue, I have done all these things in the heaven. Last week, the heavenly kingdom, the unshakable kingdom, right? I have given you Mount Zion. I have come and made covenant with you. Let brotherly love continue. That's not an optional extra. That's not a side note to the Christian faith of my salvation in Christ. That's front and center, baked in, a required part of salvation in Christ. So God's atoning sacrifice, salvation, and renewal by the Spirit, we are shown, we are commanded to show brotherly love. Let brotherly love continue. And if this is a costly virtue, brotherly love, it's costly. And one that the believers in Hebrews have already distinguished, them, distinguished themselves well on showing. Hebrews 6.10, For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown in his name by serving the saints, as you still do. So earlier on in the book, we get a compliment to the church for their brotherly love. That's why let brotherly love continue. So there's no surprise here, right, that God would command and place a chief command for us to love one another. What sums up the law and the prophets? Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
right? Matthew 22. But as, anytime we talk about love, I feel a necessity to yet again remind you that uh, you don't get to define what love is. God does. And again, we live in a postmodern society that is, you know, Disney has, has made its way with defining love as a sense of emotions and feelings that I have towards you or the pleasantness that you and I share with one another as you do something and fulfill a need for me when love is not that at all scripturally. Feelings are a part of love, but they're not love. They're a fruit or result of love. And God defines what love is. No greater love than this man, no greater love that one would lay, that one would lay down their life for another. Love is what we show and what we give and the sacrifices we put forth on the sake of another. The point being, God calls us to love and he defines what love is. So just be careful when you understand love. Remove yourself from your context. Get back into the scriptures. And so you want to know what love is? It's a selfless action that you show. What are those selfless actions? We'll read Hebrews 13. So as we go through the next several weeks of practical implications of the gospel, right? Marriage and money and leadership. <clears throat> we are going to keep framing them. And this is what love is. This is how we show love to one another. This is an outflowing of love. Because this command, let brotherly love continue, summarizes the rest of chapter 13 and all of its ethical implications. <clears throat> So let's zoom back for a moment, and, 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 and I want to help you to see why good theology leads us to brotherly love, and why theology is important when you're thinking about brotherly love and showing brotherly love. We love because God first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. Because he chose to love us before we loved him, we choose to love others even before they might choose, before they might choose to love us. And because God loves us, we take risks in love. Because God is our security. We can selflessly love, love others because our love tank is being filled by God. And we provide for others in love because God provides for us. We provide love because of good theology. Now we will, um, and you will lose, by the way, brotherly love if it's not grounded in right theology. You will either begin to misunderstand love as the world tries to twist the definition or you will give up on love because brotherly love is hard. It's costly. It's sacrificial. So we sustain in love because of theology, right? God sustains us in that. And we need brotherly love. We need the greater community because of theology. So theology, again, shapes it, that we provide love and we sustain in it and we prioritize it because of what God has done and what he's called us to. The point of this first point, don't separate the theological sections from the practical sections. And the overarching practical applications of Hebrews 13 is brotherly love. So again, all the rest of the commands will line up underneath this one and be an example of what brotherly love is. So let's look at the first one of those, which is this, right? Hospitality to strangers. Hospitality. And let's read it here. Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. First application of brotherly love is to show hospitality to strangers. Brotherly love shows itself in caring for people in need of a place to stay or a home or to rest in. Christianity was and still should be the religion of the open door, as one writer said. Now, let's give you some context. When we talk about hospitality, right, like we get, a pic we get pictures of what hospitality looks like because of way we, where we live. Get good hermeneutics and Bible study. You always have to start with, well, what did hospitality look like then? What does, you know, flush it out in their context, and then you can more accurately bridge into our context. So what was hospitality like for them? This was primarily caring for the traveler. Caring for the traveler. Hospitality to the traveler specifically was a significant cultural value of all across the Greco-Roman world. Right? The Romans were a big deal on this. The Greeks were big on this one. The Jews were big on this one. Because first century inns were notoriously immoral, unhygienic, and expensive. Uh, maybe they haven't changed very much. I'm joking. No. It, they're significantly different, right? Remember, we, we as a people are much richer and society is much safer than theirs, right? I mean, you hear people maybe canceling their travel plans because of gas prices. But, you know, like, I mean, you know, you, you read some people talking about it. Well, it's going to cost me an extra 100 bucks for the trip. And while that's a, amount of, a, a noticeable amount of money, for most of us, right, we can, we can pay the couple hundred dollars to travel and to stay in a hotel at night, even a cheap hotel. And so most of us can get to places easily, really. 
and stay at a warm, mostly clean, and inexpensive hotel. In the first century, there was much more danger on the road from bandits. And people didn't have the kind of savings and money that we have, right? They didn't have nest eggs built up to do that. They lived more day by day. And so it was an important cultural value then to welcome people in your home. They didn't have the money to provide for inns. That would be dangerous. And there's a lot of danger on the way. In fact, the Jewish tradition calls a guest to be greeted with a cheerful facial expression. Like that command. So if I greet you in my home, I can't be dour about it. I got, I'm commanded by Jewish law to greet you with a smile on your face. I do it every Sunday. <laughs> sincerely so, sincerely so. And, to, and, we, and we were to provide cheerfully. In fact, Jewish teachers said it was better to give less but to give cheerfully than to give more begrudgingly. Again, these are extra biblical commands, but just some of the context. When a Jew would hear this, right, the value is, man, I greet you cheerfully, and I should do it sincere, sincerely cheerfully. I'll give you some, provide for your needs, but don't give extra if you can't do it cheerfully. Now, I, I, I always want to note, when we talk about these principles in Scripture, right, that we have to set these in the context of wisdom. And that's one of the things we've really missed, I think, in our study of Scripture, is the very fact that there is a genre of Scripture called wisdom literature. Right, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and uh, James is a New Testament example of that. These are scriptures, or these are parts of Scripture written to instruct on wisdom. And wisdom is the wise application of biblical commands, right? The wise application of navigating life or biblical commands. We need to study this. Why do I believe we need to study and, and hone our wisdom? Sorry, I'm just I, I freestyle, so I'm skipping a few of my notes. We need, to, we need to practice wisdom when it comes to hospitality, right? One, as we talked even this morning in prayer, right? We're taught to give hospitality, but a dad would say, man, I want to give hospitality, welcome people into my home, but I also have a biblical responsibility to protect my family, right? I need to, do I need, should I just welcome anybody to my home? Or is there some type of wisdom principle that should come into play because, hey, I've got other people I'm also responsible to by God, right? And we also know that People can seek to take advantage and harm the church or abuse hospitality. And not only does that harm the one giving hospitality, it takes resources from those in need and it can harm the one giving, but it also is actually harmful to the one who takes advantage of hospitality, right? It is a bad thing for someone to be able to take advantage of hospitality repeatedly. It, it removes, well, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, right, the discipline that God provides us to correct our behavior. I need consequences so that I can learn wise behavior, right action, even as an adult before the Lord. And if we were to continue to remove consequences, it's hard for us to learn wisdom. Again, there's grace and help and need, but we need to practice wisdom. Let me illustrate this wisdom principle for you in the early church. Um, there is a writing called the Didache. It's written between 50 and 70 AD. It is the oldest non-scripture Christian writing that we have. And the Didache is an instruction manual for how to worship and how to live out the Christian life. It is based upon like, the teachings of the scriptures that we had at this point and the teachings of the apostles. Again, it's not scripture, but they're saying, hey, as we read scripture, how do we apply that into our life? And it says this, let every apostle, and in this sense they mean apostle, there's the 12 apostles, but apostles also used uh, uh, to, to define those who are traveling evangelists and preachers. So if I'm a traveling itinerant preacher, I'm an apostle. I'm a sent one going to preach a message. And there were frequently a lot of, there's a lot of these around the early church. People hearing the news and spreading all around and traveling to preach. So let me come back to the text. Let every apostle who comes to you be received as the Lord, but he must not stay more than one day or two if it's absolutely necessary. If he stays three days, he's a false prophet. And when an apostle leaves you, let him take nothing but a loaf of bread until he reaches further lodging for the night. If he asks for money, he's a false prophet. And so the, the point here is, this early church is rustling. How do we wisely apply hospitality, knowing that, again, there might be people that would take advantage. There are false prophets, wolves in sheep clothing, that were seeking to harm the church and twist it, who were out for gain and material gain, right? And so, again, wisdom applies. And we see that tradition of applying wisdom into hospitality from the very beginning. It is good to have reasonable boundaries when it comes to hospitality and to practice discernment. I'm not saying safety has to be the primary thing. I'm not saying your convenience is the primary thing. I'm saying you owe responsibility to both the individual and to your family and to the community to practice wisdom when it comes to things like this. And also I want to note the stranger they're talking to here is, is most likely and specifically Christians. 
Christians. We can assert this due to the wider teaching of Scripture, which prioritizes love for the fellow Christian, and the overarching command to brotherly love, right? You are my brother and my sister in the Lord. And that is a unique and special bond that we share that is not shared with a non-believer. They are not my brother. Right? It's why I intentionally refer to you as my brothers and sisters. I say that a lot. I try and talk to you that way. I don't do that with a non-believer because I can show them love. And I ought to show them love. I should be gracious and evangelize. But they are not my brothers and sisters. That is a unique bond that's given through the re renewal of the Holy Spirit, through acceptance into the church by God's grace. Right? We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. All right, so show hospitality. I wanted to talk about wisdom for a moment there. But let's get to this kind of, this is kind of a fun phrase. Do not neglect to show hospitality. Thereby some have entertained angels unaware. And I think about what the old uh, Newsboy song, Entertaining Angels by the Light of My TV Screen. And no, nobody else is. Somebody, anybody? Not? Thank you, thank you. You are now my favorite. Everybody else. Jeez, Maybe I sang it? Yeah. I'll put Jaden on the spot for that. You don't know what? That's your assignment before you leave, buddy. Next Sunday's your last Sunday. You're going to close us off by singing a newsboy song for us. All right. All right. Sorry. Let me get back to the text here. By entertaining angels. The phrase might be particularly difficult for us because we're much less to inclined to believe in the supernatural. I mean, that's just part of the American church, right? Uh, the Western church. We're, we're less supernaturally focused as a general rule of thumb. For the majority of the global south, where the church is really growing right now, it's just interesting to study. That'd be South America, Africa, and like southern parts of Asia. The church is exploding and expanding tremendously. And there, there's a much higher... Um, acceptance of the supernatural events of life. And so something like this would hit them a little bit differently than us. So the question for us is, is it possible to entertain angels without being aware? And the short answer would be yes. Is it extremely rare? Absolutely, it's rare. But it, it does happen. But I, I do want to note this isn't really probably the point of the passage. He's not necessarily um, saying that you're going to regularly encounter angels here. The point is, he's actually referring back to, well, when in Scripture have we seen someone entertain angels? And you see it in Genesis 18 with Abraham. And again, all throughout the book of Genesis, they keep coming back to Abraham, right? The patriarch of the faith. This is written to Jewish people to convince them to leave Judaism and come back to Christ and, and the covenant of Christ and walk in that fully. And so in Genesis 18, Abraham demonstrates hospitality to angels. And these are where two angels in, the Lord, appear to inform Abraham that Sarah would have a child the next year. And where Sarah laughs, at about it, laughs about it because she overhears. And then Abraham is subsequently blessed because of his generosity and hospitality to strangers. He sees them walking up. Let's kill the fattened calf to provide for them and provide a good meal for them. And they happen to be angels. Another great command to show hospitality um, and how it connects spiritually is Matthew 25. It says this, just as Jesus talking. And he will place the sheep on his right, and, but the goats on his left. Uh-oh. You don't want to be a goat. Then the sheep will say to the, then the king, then the king will say to those on his right, come, all you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you sick and in prison to visit you? And the king will answer them, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of, my, least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Right? So again, the point is, again, theology, praxology, what we do with each other in affects what's happening spiritually and before the Lord. So you could possibly entertain angels and what you do in showing hospitality and caring, you do unto the Lord and, and for him. So let's recap. We've considered hospita hospitality, We've connected hospitality to brotherly love, and we've given wisdom around that. We've looked at the original context and addressed the idea of entertaining angels. Now, how do we apply that today, this idea of today, um, hospitality? As I opened with this morning, that hospitality is a powerful tool for us. Right? There's an incredible opportunity for the church in these days. You don't have to be glamorous. You don't have to put on a show. You don't have to be super eloquent. Like, just the fact that you can show hospitality and welcome people into your home is a powerful way 
to witness and love people. Because again, people are struggling with loneliness and isolation, insecurity, forms of depression. And so hospitality can also help when there's division and bring people back to unity, and it can help us with, with, with witness. There's a lot of opportunities for hospitality. I know like uh, Randy and Alicia and Alex do a great job being hospitable on the ranch. If you want to help be hospitable, you can go to the Image of Oak Ranch and partner with them. You could look at foster care. That's a good but very challenging ministry. Talk to Rusty and Christine about that one. They have spent some years doing that. You can treat someone to a meal at a restaurant. Invite them out. You can invite someone into your home even. Especially a pastor. You can host a small group. There's a lot of lonely people who don't have much family. You can welcome them in, right? And there's dozens of ways to show it. There's very practical and simple ways that you and I can show hospitality to the people around us. Get to know your coworkers, your neighbors. Don't be afraid to invest into that. And hospitality is a key part of evangelism, as I've already alluded to. You know, this year is the year we're focusing on outreach, and that's why I keep mentioning Image of Branch, one of our key ministry partners. That's why we're launching the board game ministry, which should be up and running this fall. It's a way to build relationships with people and to show hospitality over a board game. Um, as we crush them. And then, but hospitality is for you and I. Each one of us is called the hospitality. And let me remind you of the biblical purpose of the church gathering of this Sunday morning. This is for the believer. It's not for evangelism. Okay? This, is, this is not evangelism right now. And this is not for the non-believer. This is for you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so while there's a chance for some conversation before and after, it's not necessarily a good time to have in-depth conversations with someone seeking Christ. And the sermon's a one-way conversation. It's a teaching. I, I'm declaring before you. I'm speaking. You're listening. So we were not, we're, we're not going to pursue a seeker-sensitive church model. That's not our MO here. Evangelism of the church is done primarily outside of Sunday morning. It's when you, have, it's when you can have those two-way conversations. It's when you can show the love of Christ. It's when you can leverage the power of the table. What better way to have a conversation and to show love than, than to invite someone into your home or to their favorite restaurant and offer them a meal? And you can cover awkward silences in conversation by eating. That's something that each one of us can do. My point is there's several tools in the evangelism toolbox. And we, li we lived in an era in, a, in the past 40 years where the, the primary and almost exclusive tool for evangelism was invite your friend to church so the pastor can get him saved as I preach from the pulpit. I, I'm here to tell you that's not, that statistically is not working. Like there's, like we keep doubling down on that strategy and you are, we're not bringing enough people to the Lord. Like, we're not even keeping up a population growth. It, we're losing more people than gaining with that kind of maneuver. Is, does God save people that way? Yes, it is a tool that should be in our toolbox. You will know. Uh, use wisdom when the right time is to invite someone who maybe, maybe even is seeking and not saved yet when they come here on Sunday morning. Like, use wisdom. But that isn't the only tool. And that might not even be the first tool. The first tool and the most powerful tool for witnessing and evangelism is you just showing hospitality getting to know them, building the relationship, sharing the conversations together. Amen? All right. That's your, way, that's your one chance to talk back in the sermon. We've addressed brotherly love in the context of the traveler in need of hospitality, but what about those who, because of the restriction on their freedom, cannot come visit our homes, but need us to go visit them? Let's get to the last point of the sermon today, and those imprisoned and mistreated. Verse 3 says this, Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. Now this, again, this is the context of this is, is again, speaking primarily about the church and fellow believers. Not saying we don't do this for non-believers, but this is primarily for believers. So the prisoners here are referring to Christians in prison for their faith or for practices related to their faith. Again, remember, there's this ongoing rhythm and cycle, ebbs and flows in the early church of it's accepted, and then there's firm persecution and lots of Christians are in prison. And prison was a, much different for them than for us. Um, prison in those days was never really used as a consequence to itself. Like for us, prison's a consequence, right? You do something wrong, we're going to isolate you from society so you can't do anything wrong for a while um, to, or hurt anybody else. And that in itself is the punishment. But in this time, the prison was really just a holding cell or holding time before you received your consequence. The consequence of, you know, punishment, beating, lashings, killings, right? Crucifixions. Um, so this was kind of a holding time and holding pattern. Though there were some times when if you were in enough trouble, you would be put into slavery. And there's different types of slavery, but one of the worst was, the, uh, was slavery in the mines. 
It's kind of like being sent to Siberia in the Soviet Union, right? Or forced labor camps. Like, we're going to put you in a place where you're never going to get out of a hole so deep, you're never coming out, and you're going to die in the mine bringing us material. And so because it was a temporary thing, or it's a very devastating thing, they didn't really care much about the health and wel- welfare of people in prison. Um, it wasn't uncommon for, for people in prison to depend upon outside people to bring them food and water. Right? So I'm not going to feed you when you're in prison. I'm not wasting my resources to feed you. And so they were dependent upon friends and family to come bring them food and water, which, by the way, is a great like trap, you know, because if I'm going to arrest you for being a Christian, then I'm just going to wait to see what other people come bring you food and guess that they're probably Christian too. This also included those needing to be ransomed from bandits. There's some pretty interesting uh, testimonies in the early church about people gather, churches gathering up money to pay off bandits to ransom their, their Christian brothers and sisters. So it's a common deal back in the day. Not on, um, and again, the church has already been complimented for doing a good job on this. So how do we apply this, right? That's kind of the context. Your brothers and sisters would be arrested for their faith in need. Don't forget them. Go have the faith to go to the prison and bring them food and water. Go bring them fellowship and show them love, even though they're isolated and it risks you. How do we do this today? Um, there's things like the voice of the martyrs. They, I read one of their stories last. I read one of their stories last week. And uh, UB Global is another good resource to find reputable organizations that are working with those in prison for their faith around the world. There's, there's things we can do. We can give money, we can pray, we can partner with. Um, I wouldn't suggest going to visit them. Thank you. No, I, I was hoping someone would catch that one. Um, we, the point is we can leverage the position that God has given us as Americans. The, the fact is we are the richest and most influential country on the planet. And so we have an ability to, to influence other governments and organizations in a way that other countries can't. And we can leverage our position given by God to do good things. But we can also do things like prison fellowship. That's uh, by Chuck Colson. Or maybe you've seen uh, Angel Tree Christmas. That's uh, part of this ministry. And so there's opportunities here to support those helping those who are incarcerated today, both Christians and non-Christians. We To faithfully administer justice in a way that aims to restore and to be a good mission field, right? you got a captive audience, so to speak. Damn. I got, I, got, I got excited. I had one or two laughs, and I've been trying too hard. I got to, let's just move on. So there's ways that, and, there's, and you can do stuff in, in Allen County, in DeKalb County. There's ways that you can invest in, in, in the prisons and go visit and help and witness. Um, but the third thing, again, application for this, not only those in prison across the world, not only those in prison locally, but also, again, the elderly. That oftentimes they can be imprisoned in their homes or nursing homes without family to care and visit. So we can show brotherly love by investing time in this way or bringing them with us to a church gathering. And I do want to gently remind you that the way we approach, vis- the way we approach visitation at Hopewell is a little bit different um, than maybe you, you might, what you might be used to. Scripturally, we as, uh, we as the elders and me as the pastor have some responsibility for this, right? We are to care and shepherd the flock, so that's on our plate for sure. But, we're not, but it's not exclusively to us. This, this command to show hospitality is not leveled specifically to leadership. It's a command for all of us as a church to participate in. So, so my, my encouragement to all of us is that we each have a responsibility to care for our brothers and sisters of the Lord and to go visit and make time to do that. And I know many of you do, and I just want to say thank you. Let me, as we close off today, you know, we, we look at a pastors like today and say, man, there's things I can do, showing hospitality and prison ministries and people around the globe and shut-ins. What do we do? Man, that seems like a lot. I just added to my to-do list. And, and it's easy when we see all these opportunities and commands in Scripture to get overwhelmed. I don't know about you, but I can get that way. Like I said, I, I feel do, you know, I, the to-do list gets too long for me to f- feel like I can manage and handle. But I want to remind you that, that this is a team effort. This is a team effort. God doesn't expect us to do every good thing, but he expects us to do the good things he's put in front of us to do and called us to do. And he expects us to work together as a team. Um, one of the ways that we do this, for instance, we partner in men's ministry with South Scipio Church, one of our sister churches, right? And they're investing in the um, Woodburn uh, Christian's home, children's home. And they do some work like this. They show hospitality to the kids in need, right? And it's a great ministry. It's not our ministry to partner with, but it's South Scipio's ministry to partner with. It's in their yard. It's in their turf. They're partnering along. But we went and partnered with South Scipio to go bless the children's home on the last men's ministry day, right? So we can partner along. It's not our ministry. We can partner and help. And we can do the same thing for each other, right? You're not going to be able to do all of this ministry, but someone in this body is going to be doing some ministry like that. Someone in the community will be. And so how do we help them do ministry? How do we partner along on occasion? How do we support them and encourage our brothers and sisters, right? And then how do we keep an open heart and an open schedule to say, God, I, I'll prioritize what you say is important 
more than just me, me watching more movies, you know, or whatever it is that we get into, right? All right. In closing, let me wrap up. Get, get you out of here for hamburgers and hot dogs and fireworks. I, w- I want to remind you that brotherly love is a, necess- a necessary response to what God has done for us. Remember, theology leads to praxology, right? What God does determines what we do. And that brotherly love expresses itself not in a bunch of feelings and emotion, not in flowerly language primarily. It shows itself in hospitality. I love you because I show you hospitality. And care for those who are imprisoned and mistreated. Right? That's how I show love. I care and I welcome you. Amen? Amen. All right. And if we can do this, church, I think, that's a, I think we're at a spot to have a powerful witness to the world if we can get this stuff under, uh, do this in ever-increasing ways. Let me pray for us, and we'll close us here. God, I want to say thank you first for the hospitality that you have shown me. You have welcomed me into your family, into your home. um, And you have a a full and perfect home awaiting. We just say thank you for that. Because of what you've done, you've empowered us and equipped us to do amazing things also. So God, I pray for us as a church that you would help each one of us to be open-eared and sensitive and thoughtful and wise so that we align our priorities with your priorities and that we hear your, and that we, we respond when you indicate that it's time for us to move and to jump and to go and to serve. So God, I pray that you'd help us with that today. God, I pray a blessing over my church family. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the brotherly love that they have showed me and my family. That is a, a unique and valuable thing about this community. And we just say thank you for that. And God, may you help us to continue to show that to people in our lives that you've put in proximity to us. Help us, Lord. God, I do pray that you would help us this weekend to recreate well, to be grateful well, and to love well. And by golly, we might have a chance to show hospitality this weekend yet. And may we do that well. God, we just thank you for you are a good God. You take good care of us. We just thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. And hey, and now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, including hospitality working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hey, go have a blessed 4th of July. Eat some hot dogs for me.